should maybe await a few more seconds. So before we start, Jonathan, is it okay? Do you prefer people to ask questions during the talk or wait until, until you're done? No, I think go ahead. Please feel okay. totally free. You can make it into a more discussion if you like or whatever, okay, whatever is most valuable for the, for the people. Okay, then I suggest when, when you have a question during the talk, just unmute and ask the speaker right away. So my experience with Zoom is that asking questions in the chat does not really work because as a speaker, you don't look at the chat and your slides and everything. So if you have something to, to ask, just unmute. Um, whenever you don't have to ask anything, just put a mute so we avoid some echoes and things like this. And uh, now I think I think we we can we can start right. So welcome everybody to our next uh, distinguished lecture on mathematical physics. Um, our speaker today is Professor Jonathan Wiley. So he got his PhD and, and later a junior research fellowship from King's College in Cambridge and has published in very important and, and nice journals of physics, for example, PRL and also uh, in science. And he's more on the applied side and as far as I understand, even has industrial applications of his research. And um, I'm very much looking forward to his talk here in, the, in, in our seminar. His title is Deflection of a Dilute Stream of Particles. So Jonathan, please. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And also I'd like to very much thank um, Shushin Lasher for, uh, for uh, inviting me. It's really a big, big pleasure. And uh, uh, I'd, uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about today is actually I'm going to give you a, just a quick overview of two, um, two results that I've found, which are kind of accessible, uh, I think, and also kind of surprising. At, le at least I hope that they'll be surprising. And these are work, joint work uh, together with uh, uh, Dong Yu Hui, who used to be my student. And uh, he's currently in uh, UIC, which is in Zhuhai. And also with uh, my, uh, actually currently my colleague, um, Zhang Chang, and he will in fact move to UIC in just a few weeks time. So, what's happening? Oops. Yeah, so I will go through, uh, in this first, uh, first topic, I will go through an introduction to what are granular materials. I think probably many of you know, but I'll just give you a brief introduction. I'll formulate the problem I'm going to talk about. Then I'm going to show some numerical results and some kind of surprises. And then I'm going to show how we can theoretically analyze this problem. I'll just go through the brief outline of that. And then I'll look to understand, so we can understand uh, how, we, how we're going to use this theoretical approaches to understand the mechanisms and, uh, uh, and understand that how valid those mechanisms are. So what, what is a granular material? I think probably all of you know, granular material is a kind of conglomeration of discrete, solid, uh, large-scale particles. So sand or um, rice, you know, big, lo 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 big blocks of rice, the big, uh, large amounts of rice, this would be considered to be a, a granular material. And because the particles are, they are macroscopic, when two particles collide with one another, they lose energy. Okay, the, that's an um, inelastic uh, process. So it's different. So granular materials are fundamentally different from gases. Okay, gases, okay, you also have some kind of gas molecules, but when two gas molecules collide with one another, it's basically a quantum interaction, those that conserves energy. So that's the main thing with granular materials, why they're different from gases. They lose energy when two particles interact or collide. So granular flows are just flows which are formed by granular materials. Okay, that's pretty simple. And here, here are, you know, granular materials are basically everywhere. They're extremely important in industry. And here we can just see a few examples, sand piles, 
train, uh, train tracks are placed on top of granular materials like little blocks of rocks. Here's some workers moving the grain and here's an example of uh, rice. So in fact, in, in, in the uh, topics which are studied, widely studied, the mechanics are usually fluid mechanics and solid mechanics. Granular material is seldomly studied. I mean, it, it is a kind of, it's become a little bit of a more mainstream topic, but given the industrial difficulties that granular materials call, uh, cause, there actually has not really been that much study in granular materials comparatively. You know, fluid mechanics now is well developed. There's problems, you know, turbulence and so on, but basically fluid mechanics are very well, you know, mature topic. Solid mechanics is also a very mature topic. Again, of course, there's pro some problems, outstanding problems, but granular materials, it's much more problems than it is solutions. Okay? There's still thousands of very, very challenging topics in granular materials, which still, you know, you know, still out there to be solved. So, you know, I think for many people, it's a very exciting area. And it's also very industrially important, in, uh, a very industrially important topic, because so many industrial processes involve the transport and the, the sorting of granular materials. I'm not going to go into that in big detail. So, um, I'm particularly interested in, uh, there, there are really two kinds of granular materials. One kind is like this, a kind of static sand pile. You've just got, you know, granular materials which are just sitting there or moving very, very slowly, so quasi-static materials. I'm actually interested in the opposite, which is so-called rapid granular flow. And what you can see here is a, um, this was a storage container for a grain and uh, it actually failed, there was a failure event. And when that failure event occurred, the, 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 the grain just actually went, uh, you know, started flowing very, very quickly. And here's another example. This is a rock avalanche. This is formed by um, uh, rocks falling down a, down a mountainside. And uh, something perhaps we're more familiar with is snow avalanches. Snow avalanches are also a kind of granular material. Snowflakes are a little bit different because they, uh, they also adhere, but they're still a kind of granular material. So this is what we, we're thinking about. We're thinking about when granular particles move quickly. Okay. Not a bit, we're not talking about the static case. Now, the, for this particular problem, the motivation I'm interested in is um, deflectors. So let, let's take a look at this picture. So in the, in the bottom of the picture, what you, this is an aerial picture looking from above. And what you can see down here at the bottom of the picture is a, a village. Okay? And up here is a, um, um, the mountain. And of course, <laughs> living in this village is extremely dangerous because you know, you can e very easily have rock, rock avalanches which fall down here and basically destroy the village. So what villages do, what these mountain villages have to do is they need to build deflectors. And you can see that here, this is the, uh, there's a left uh, uh, arm of the deflector and then here's the right arm of the deflector. And of course the rocks come down, they'll hit the deflector and will be, uh, and will hopefully avoid the village. So. These deflecting dams are, you know, obviously this is a very yeah. basic concept. And, uh, uh, and the design of these so-called, you know, passive protection methods, unfortunately, it does not really have a very solid theoretical underpinning. So what you find is that engineers have some kind of rules of thumb and so on and so forth, but usually they, they don't, um, they don't really have a very solid, concrete way of knowing exactly what to do. So that's perhaps surprising. It seems like a very simple topic, but we'll see, we'll see why, the, why it can be more complicated than you perhaps may imagine. Okay. And of course, the, you know, what's the, what's the, uh, the key, uh, the key uh, parameter is how much force uh, is this wall gonna have, how much force is this deflecting wall gonna have to absorb, okay, during the course of an avalanche, okay? 
And what we're going to do is there are two, there are two approaches to granular materials. One is you'd kind of develop some continuum model, uh, which uh, can treat it as a whole, like you would in gas dynamics. And the other extreme is to just look at the particle scale. So what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to look at the particle scale. The, the continuum, prop, the continuum uh, theories in granular materials are, of course, are, are quite developed, but there are, there are issues with these, these models. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the dilute case. And in fact, there's a lot of work done on the dense granular material case when you have many particles very close to one another. And that usually is studied using continuum models. So dilute granular materials could be done by granular material, or it could be done by dilute, or it could be done by continuum, or it could be done by at the particle level. So we're going to look at it on the particle level. But I think in, in the granular material uh, community, it, if you ask people about dilute flows, they usually tend to think that, oh, dilute flows actually are simple. You know, there's not many collisions. Everything is, everything is basically straightforward. And I, I hope that I can convince you this is not true. Okay, even though the flows are dilute, the problems are stripped down. The problems to you know very very basic kind of you know canonical physics problems. We'll still see that you can get quite surprising behavior. Okay, so let's look at the simple model system. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got a barrier, which is, uh, um, has an angle theta. We're gonna have particles, which we're going to uh, shoot them towards the barrier. And they're gonna hit the barrier and they're gonna rebound off the barrier. And then, you know, they may or may not collide with other incoming particles. So it's super simple problem. Okay, it's a really simple problem. So we're not going to include any gravity. We could put that in if we wanted, but for the purposes of uh, simplicity, just trying to get the simplest possible system, we are going to ignore, we're going to neglect gravity. Okay. So what are we, what are we going to do? So yeah, we're going to basically make this as simple as possible. We get all the particles are going to be the same size and they're going to be the same mass. They're going to be spheres and they're going to be smooth. So this is not going to be no friction. It's only going to be collisional impacts, which transfer momentum from one particle to another. Okay. And uh, again, for simplicity, I'm going to say that all of the incoming particles, they're going to move in the same direction. I'm going to say we're going to give them all the same initial velocity. So this, this, this for various theoretical reasons for doing this, it makes it you know, much simpler. Otherwise you have, uh, otherwise the, the jet, the ink, if the particles have different velocities, the particles can collide with one another without hitting the wall. And so the jet will spread. It just becomes a kind of, um, you know, there's more complicating features. So this makes it the simplest possible um, a non-trivial uh, situation. So there's going to be a few geometric parameters that we're going to introduce. And uh, so the first one is we're going to have, uh, we're going to choose, we're going to randomly choose the, the, uh, the Z location. Z is the, the location uh, perpendicular to the flow. So we're going to, the input locations of the particles are going to be distributed according to some uh, given distribution. So that's going to be random location, the Z location of the particles will be random. And uh, we're also going to have a, um, a distance. It's going to be here, we're going to mu Y. We're going to have a distance, which is the distance between adjacent particles. And again, that could be, that could be random. So we are going, so let's first of all, talk about the distance between adjacent particles. And uh, it's going to have a given distribution. For what, for what I'm, I'm going to simplify this again as much as possible. I'm going to say this is going to be non-random. So I'm going to just put particles into the system every um, distance mu y. And uh, we'll, create a, we'll create a parameter v, which is the mean separation in y divided by the radius of the particle, dimensionless parameter. And in the z direction, 
course, the mean doesn't really play any role because I can move it up and down. I can move the mean. I can translate the mean. It wouldn't do anything. So but what we really care about is the standard deviation. How much spread is there in the jet? That tells us how much spread is there in the z direction in the jet. And uh, so we could choose any distribution. So for what I'm going to talk about today, we'll just talk about a Gaussian distribution. And we'll have a parameter s, which tells us you know, how, how widely spread, what, what is the standard deviation of, in the jet width divided by the radius. So those are going to be our two, two geometric parameters, v and s. And there are also two particle parameters. So that tells us that um, when two particles collide, they uh, have a coefficient of restitution, which is e. e is between 0 and 1. So if e is equal to 1, the collision is considered to be perfect, perfectly elastic, no energy lost. If e is equal to 0, then the component of uh, momentum um, um, uh, par perpendicular to the, uh, sorry, parallel to the collision is actually completely destroyed. Yeah, so you know all of the all of that component of the of the uh, momentum will will just uh, will just uh, basically be, be, be completely lost. So um, that's for when particles collide with one another, they have a coefficient of restitution. And you can also have another; it could be a, potentially a different coefficient of restitution when particles collide with the wall. And uh, so that we'll call that EW, the coefficient of restitution with, for, for the wall, collisions with, between particles on the wall. Okay, so we can, we can solve this problem numerically. So we just make a domain which is much larger than the, the this length scales in the problem. And in fact, there are two ways you can propagate particles. So there's you know, something called collision detection method, which is, I didn't have room to write that. It's basically a kind of exact method. What you do is you look at all possible binary events and you work out at what time would, sorry, you look at all possible two, all possible pairs of particles and you work out the time that each pair of particles would collide. The particles are just going in straight lines, so it's easy to do. And um, having done that, you choose the obviously you choose the first event, which um, uh, the first time two particles collide, that will be our first collision time. And then what you do is you use the collision rules, the simple mechanical collision rules to update the um, particle velocity, and then you repeat again. So this this treats the particles as hard spheres, which is what we want. Uh, it's very quick and it works very well for dilute systems and uh, it treat it, it the drawback of it is that it can only treat binary events so in fact when particles lose energy I think probably many of you know what you can do is you can actually get an infinite number of collisions in a finite time so the particle can and and uh, you know, just like when you drop drop something onto a table, it will also experience an infinite number of collisions in a finite time. And this so this method will get trapped whenever you have this um, uh, infinite collisions in finite time. So this method has a drawback. So because of that, we need to sometimes switch to another method. Whenever we have these kind of drawbacks, we have to switch to a method which is basically based on a kind of potential. And now we make that we treat the particles as being slightly soft spheres. When they overlap, we say they have a you know, strong potential force. And uh, unfortunately, this method is much, much slower than the, 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 the other method. And uh, it's also, uh, but it, it can work very well for dense systems. So this is basically how we solve this problem. It's actually no, it's really no big deal. It's not, a, not particularly difficult. And because we're gonna mostly in this talk, we're gonna talk about dilute systems. We will, almost all the numerical methods I'll show will have been found using collision detection or 
exact method. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time talking about that. So let's just go straight into the numerical results. So let me remind you again. So S is the basically the width of the jet. It's like the measure of transverse separation. V is the distance between adjacent particles. So that's the longitudinal separation. Remember, theta is the barrier angle. And what I'm plotting here is the mean dimension, that's the mean force on the vertical axis against the angle of the, um, of the um, deflector. So if the angle was zero, then you can imagine what happens is the, the particles are hitting the, hitting the uh, wall at a very, very uh, obtuse angle. And so the deflection is very, very weak. And so there's gonna be a very weak um, force on the, um, on the, on the, um, on the barrier and you can see that obviously when the angle is zero you'll have zero fours and uh, but as you increase the angle then you know up until 90 degrees which is basically fully perpendicular the force increases and here we can see what happens when the uh, when the particles are coming close to one another we have a slight we, the, the force is a little lower when the particles are more separated the, um, the force is a little higher. This is basically the force here is dimension, non-dimensionalized, essentially the force per particle that the, 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 the wall feels. So basically what, what's the message? The, the message is very, very simple and all engineers know this. Okay? Increase the angle of the barrier and you increase the force on the wall. Okay. I, no one would be surprised by that. And that is one of the basic rules of thumbs engineers use when constructing these barriers. However, so that, let, let me just mention, that was when S equals 20. So that means the jet is pretty wide, okay? S is 20 is pretty wide jet. The jet is spread over a bunch of, you know, 20 particles. So let's look at what happens when we have a, a more focused jet. So the, the S now is only five, and we've got the same, we've got the restitution coefficients are the same. And now you can see, well, when the particles are coming, cl uh, inputted close to one another, you can see in this curve here, we basically still get the same behavior. However, when you, ink, when you make the particles more separated, you can see surprisingly, it hits a kind of maximum, the force, per, the force hits a maximum, and then decreases. So surprisingly, 90 degrees is not the most, um, uh, is, does not give you the biggest force. The biggest force occurs at, uh, you know, here say, you know, 70 something degrees. And I think that's something that engineers were not, were not aware of. Now let's make, let's come over here and let's make the jet even more narrow. So now it's only basically one particle diameter and you can see the effects got even stronger. Okay, we can see this uh, effect now becomes much more um, pronounced. And even more surprisingly, if I make the jet very, very narrow. So now basically it's just like firing all the particles with just a little bit of randomness. And now you can see, okay, wow, a lot of crazy things are happening. You can see, uh, the, the, the force can increase and then decrease and then increase again. Or if you look over here, it can, let's see, it can decrease and then go flat and then decrease, whoops, sorry, and then increase and decrease, <laughs> a lot of oscillations, a lot of crazy oscillation. So what's going on? Why do we get this? So I think as far as, as, far as we're aware, no engineers were familiar with this topic. Okay, they, I think they always tried to build their barriers uh, in, in such a way that, that they, they were anticipating that the smaller the angle, the, the better, the, um, the, sm the weaker the force would be. Okay, now let's also look at what happens with respect to the coefficient of restitution. So here I'm going to look at three different angles. This is actually most angles have this property. So this is any angles less than about 80, 84 degrees, 
they have this property that when you increase the coefficient of restitution, you decrease the force on the wall. However, if you go to very big angles, like close to 90, what you can obtain is that the, the, you have the opposite effect. So as you increase the coefficient of restitution, you actually increase the force on the wall. And there's a, there's a kind of narrow range where sometimes it decreases, you know, basically it's a non-monotonic function of E. And again, that's a big surprise. So uh, why, why is that? Okay, that really is something you would never uh, anticipate. Okay. So in order to understand these things, what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a theoretical approach. And the, what, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna assume that this is gonna be our fundamental assumption that any given particle will experience at most one particle-particle collision. The particle can hit the wall as many times as it has to, but in terms of particle-particle collisions, we're only gonna take into account one particle-particle collision. And then after this collision occurs, you know, one or one of the particles or both of the two particles, they can hit the wall again, but any further particle-particle collisions, we're gonna neglect them. And under this framework, there actually are three possible things that can happen. So let's look here. The first one, the first particle comes in, hits the wall, bounces off. The second particle comes in, hits the wall and bounces off, and they never interact. So this is the simplest case. There's the, the next easiest case, though, in the next most simple case, I guess, is the first particle hits the wall, bounces back. The second particle comes in. The first and the second particle collide with one another. The second particle go, bounces off, and goes off to infinity, and the first particle hits the wall again and bounces off. And then finally, the, uh, there's another situation. The first and the second particle collide with one another, and then the second particle hits the wall again. Uh, sorry, the second particle hits the wall once and bounces off, and the first particle hits the wall again and bounces off. And we will uh, ignore any further collisions after this. So this is the three possible things that can happen. And I'm not going to go through this in a whole bunch of detail because it's kind of um, it's kind of um, uh, you know, it's a big probability thing. So I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's maybe too late <laughs> to concentrate on these kind of things. But basically, we set up a bunch of events, like there's certain thing, a certain kind of particle, the nth particle collides with the jth particle, and uh, so on and so forth. And we basically set up a bunch of probabilistic events. And we um, Let's see. So we only allow, um, yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is the very simplest thing you can do is just assume that uh, each particle may only collide with its the particle that just came in before it and the particle that came in after it, its two nearest neighbors. And um, so in this case, it. it it simplifies the probability a little bit. So there are some, let, let me skip through this. Basically, it's not particularly difficult. It's, it's just a standard thing in probability, but there's a lot of annoying notation. Okay, so uh, in, the, in, in the first case where the particles don't collide with one another, what you can do is you just work out the force on the wall, and uh, that's just straightforward. Nothing to do. In the second case, what you will do is you'll work out the force on the wall from the first particle, that's easy. And then uh, that will also occur in the third case. But in the, um, in the other cases, you're gonna have to work out. So the force on the wall is just easy to work out. It's just geometrically, or, or the impulse on the wall is easy to work out because we know the incoming, ang we know the incoming speed and the incoming angle is just completely straightforward. This is a little harder because we don't, you know, there's various different collision angles that could have occurred between the first and the second particle. And that will, you know, by knowing the distribution of those angles, we can work out the, um, the, the force on this um, 
on this um, the impulse on this on the wall due to this collision. And same thing here, we need to work out the we need to know the distribution of the possible angles that these two particles can collide with one another. Then we can work out the forces. So. Um, we can work out uh, we can work out this uh, if we only consider the, the nearest neighbor particles we can actually uh, we can actually do this calculation and uh, it's the, the formulas are written here and we could do it with the previous we could extend this to do the previous two particles the particle the particle two particles in front of it and two particles behind it and then ignore all other collisions and we can do that and it just gets a little more complicated and we could do it for three particles and four particles you know the more you do that each time you do it it gets a little more complicated and the forces can be computed and stuff all this stuff is pretty basic you know it's a little tedious but it's not it's you know it's, it's nothing particularly hard or, or or particularly interesting so for, for the results I'm going to show you, what I'm going to um, focus on is our theoretical results, just you looking at nearest neighbors. This can already capture most of the interest in physics in the problems. The other, the other, if you go to second nearest neighbors, they're basically just small perturbations and seems not to give it so much interesting behavior. Okay, so we can actually obtain a formula. So there's uh, two parts to the formula. Basically, this is the first part, which is this is what happens when there's kind of no collisions. And then this is something we have to correct over for, for, for the various. Uh, th these, are the, these are the effects of the collisions uh, on the impacts on the wall. Okay. And uh, we need to know, compute this joint density function. That also can be done relatively easy. And if we compute this, we can compute this integral. If I, if I take uh, a Gaussian distribution, we can just do some algebra on this, on this integral and we can get a closed form solution. So it's a bit of a mess. You know, we've got like a bunch of lines, four or five lines of, uh, of various things and, you know, various different quantities, C plus and C minus, but all these things are just simple, um, simple, um, expressions involving you know the parameters theta v s e and e w so there we uh, there we have the exact formula so that's pretty nice so let's see how it works so and 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 whether you know what's the validity of this theory so basically the theory gives a good approximation as long as the fraction of particles that experience two or more particle particle collisions is low because our theory will perfectly account for one particle particle collision it's only when you start getting many particles which have two three four interparticle collisions that we will have a problem so it turns out that if v cos theta is large okay so that means that the angle basically the angle of the um of the of the um either the separation between particles when you input them or the angle is if the, the separation is big enough or if the angle is uh, flat you know as far is small enough then that collision probability will be low and so here i've plotted um, uh, the mean force against v for different angles and the blue is the theoretical result the red is the numerical result so you can see if you, as long as you go to very as long as you put the particles in you know v is large that means the particles are well separated you get almost perfect agreement and it's only in fact when theater when theater is 20 that means the the angle the um the um the wall is, is is not very perpendicular you actually get pretty good agreement here you can see 0.48 even when you have very very small v okay? you can get 0.48 and 0.52 is a force. So that's actually very, very good agreement. However, when the angle gets big, you get close to 90 degrees, then you can see, all right, the theory is it's not working for small V, but works, you know, works better for, for large V. And that, that's 
kind of what you would expect. Okay, so let's look at another plot. This is the mean force against the um, collision, the, the, the barrier angle. And the red is a theoretical result, and the blue is the numerical result. So this is a pretty focused, and again, you can see it's not when we have the low angle, it, this thing works very well. When we have a bigger angle, it doesn't work so well. But this is not very dilute jet. We have V equals three, that's relatively closely packed. And we've got S, S equals one, that's also relatively closely packed. Still gives a pretty good agreement. And what we're plotting in the, this uh, secondary pane is the probability of a particle-particle collision occurring. And uh, let's see, so the, um, the <laughs> let me remember this. The red one is the uh, theoretical, probability of a particle-particle collision happening. The blue one is actually the measured probability of a particle-particle collision occurring. And the dotted one is the numerical probability of, of more than uh, two or more particle collisions happen, uh, occurring. So basically what you can see is our theory works very well until you start getting you know a relatively large number of um, um, two or more particle collisions and so yeah the theory works well to up to about 30 degrees and you can see that's the point where you know more than half of the particles are experiencing two or more collisions so this theory actually works surprisingly well, you know, even though, you know, we need that number to be low. We need the number of two particle collision, number of particles experienced two or more collisions should be low, but it's still not too bad, even when it's like about a half. So that seems to be good. Okay, now let's go look at one of these, these strange cases where the, where the, um, where the, the force decreases and then increases again and actually decreases again. Now, let, let's see what happens. So the theory and the, and the uh, so this is, I should say, this is a case where the, the, the um, whoops, I'm sorry. This is a case where the, uh, where the, um, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the jet is very narrow, only about one. And uh, so let's see what we have here. So the, yeah, yeah. So the, there's amazing agreement. It's extremely good agreement right up until this point here where we have uh, the, two, the two results are diverging. And if, if we look at the probability of particle-particle collisions, the, the theoretical one, this is for one, one collision, the theoretical probability of one collision and the numerical probability of one collision are almost the same. So even though you have very high probability of particles colliding, we still very well predict the, the force. And the, uh, the problem only starts to occur when you get more and more particles experiencing two or more collisions. And that's this, this little area here. So we can actually capture this, our theory captures this decrease and this increase. And uh, what's this? So this is an even more, uh, this is a more difficult case, but we still can do pretty well. We still can capture it. And again, the problem is only arising when the um, a number of part, the probability of particles experiencing two or more collisions is getting high. So this theory works actually pretty well. Now, now we want to try and explain why. Why does this, why do we have this phenomena which the engineers hadn't really thought of. Why can the force decrease with increasing angle? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna split the, the, the force, the mean force into geometric effects, into what I call two part, a product, a geometric effects, and uh, what I'm gonna call a scattering effects. So if you look at the, the formula, you see the, the geometric effect is just the mean force is two times sine theta. And the scattering effect, basically if you have low density, this thing just reduces to one. 
So the geometric effect, if the, if the, if the density is low, then the geometric effect dominates and we just get two times sine theta. So that's exactly what you expect. Lard, when, you know, when, you make a, when you make the angle bigger, you have a larger deflector angle, and that means the velocity component perpendicular to the wall is bigger, therefore you get a larger impulse. And this is what creates the geometric effect. So that basically, that two sine theta is just drawn as this dotted line here. Oops, I'm sorry, on these graphs. Okay, so you can see that the geometric effect is uh, capturing everything up until here about 45 degrees. And when we have a more uh, dilute jet, it's capturing it all the way up to like 70 degrees. So geometric effect can be very, very important. But when, uh, when we go to higher angles, then somehow this scattering, um, the scattering uh, effect is becoming important. Uh, uh, sorry, shielding, not scattering, shielding effect. What I'm gonna call the shielding effect. Now, what is the shielding effect? So, okay, the imp basically the impulse experienced by the wall is the net change of momentum experienced by the particles, you know, just by Newton's law of opposite, equal and opposite forces. So when a particle rebounds from the wall, uh, they can, so, so, so let me just go, go back. Yeah. So when particles rebound from the wall, they can collide with the incoming particles and then be scattered. And this scattering effect can reduce the net impulse on the wall. We can, this, is, this is exactly this factor here, Fs. This is exactly what that measures. So let me give the simplest example of shielding. So I'm gonna take the angle of the wall is 90 degrees and I'm gonna show two possible things that can happen. Okay, so let's look at the first one. So this is, the first one is no shielding. Particle one comes in, hits the wall and rebounds. Now, what's the impulse? What, what's, the, what's the impulse that the wall has exerted? It's twice the mass, it, it's the mass times twice the velocity. You know, it, it, the velocity is changed from plus V to minus V. So this particle here, particle one is, uh, exerted an impulse of 2 mv, 2 times the mass times the velocity. And the second particle is the same. It comes in, hits the wall and bounces back, also 2 mv. So the net impulse is just 4v, 4, m, 4 times the mass times v. Mass here is said to be 1, so it's just 4 times v. Now, that's the, this is the kind of no shielding. Now let's take the most extreme example possible of shielding. Okay, the first particle comes in, hits the wall and rebounds. The impulse is 2v, two, or two times the mass times v. Now, the first particle hits the second particle. And if we choose the angle, if we select that, that angle to be um, optimal, then what will happen is that uh, the first particle and the second particle will both propagate parallel to the wall. I should say this is in the elastic case. So in that case, those, neither of those two particles will ever hit the wall again, and the total net impulse will be 2v, or two times the mass times v. So actually you can see this shielding effect in its most extreme case can halve the net impulse on the wall. And, uh, but of course, usually we don't achieve that, that perfect halving because, um, because um, uh, you know, not all you know, we get a mixture. Sometimes we get this. Sometimes we get this. So you get a kind of mixture. But you can still see we can get pretty significant shielding effects. So here we get you know we've gone from two to about one point five. Here we've gone from two to about one point two. And here you can see we're going from about two to one point two or something. So yeah, the shielding effect can be very, very significant. So that basically is the mechanism. That's why we have this decrease. Now let's go, let's return to the other topic, which is how do we, the mean force, how does it depend on the coefficient of restitution? Does it, why does it sometimes decrease? Why does it sometimes increase? And why can it sometimes be non-monotonic? 
Well, I'm going to introduce the concept of what are called glancing and head-on collisions. So let's see. I think, yeah, let, let's just go to this. So what I've done is I've rotated the frame because it just makes it a bit easier. So the first particle has come down, has hit the wall and has, and has bounced back. And now it's going to, uh, sorry, what, what's happened? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is what I'm going to call a glancing collision. So the first particle comes down, hits the wall and bounces back. And now the second particle comes and hits the first particle. And I'm going to call it glancing because what's going to happen is the second particle is going to go um, uh, go and hit the wall, and the first particle will will go will go off uh, uh, in, in uh, will go off and not hit the wall again. So because of the coefficient of restitution, what that does is it makes the larger I make the coefficient of restitution, the more the second particle bounces back from the first particle. And so you make the angle that the, the second particle is going to hit the wall with will be decreased. So the for, for glancing collisions, the larger the coefficient of restitution, it means that the second particle is, def is deflected at a larger angle, and that means less impact on the barrier for glancing collisions. Now the other kind of collision is head-on collisions. And by that, what I mean is the first particle comes down, hits the second particle, and now the first particle is gonna hit the wall again. And in this case, it's the opposite effect. The larger E, the first particle bounces back somehow faster. And so it therefore has more impact on the barrier. And so this, tells you that, um, oh, sorry, this basically tells you that, if we go back to this, this, um, this is dominated by glance, th these types of situations are dominated by glancing collisions, this type of situation is dominated by head-on collisions, and this is different parts of the uh, space are, are, are dominated by, you know, this is dominated by glancing, this is dominated by head-on. So that's how we can explain that mechanism. So let's go through this again quickly. So what have we done? We've considered a system where you have a dilute stream of particles that collides with an oblique wall. And of course, it's very important for diverting particle avalanches and for many other applications. For dilute particle streams, uh, the large deflector angle may actually decrease the mean force. That's obviously the opposite of our intuition. What we've done is we've derived an exact solution for the mean force on the wall, and we've got very good agreement with our numerical results, you know, as long as the system is dilute. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to explicitly kind of quantify geometric and shielding effects, and we've been able to explain the mechanism for why this anti-intuitive behavior exists. And we can understand, by looking at our formula, we can understand how geometric and shielding effects compete with one another. And we've also been able to explain the, um, the um, um, uh, uh, how it depends on E. So I've spent a little bit long time but there's a, on that topic, but there's another topic I'd like to quickly discuss with you, if I can. So this is about inelastic particles falling through a hopper. So let's look at what we have here. So it's, a, it's another very basic system. We have two walls which form a, what's called a hopper, and you drop particles under gravity, the particles hit the walls, bounce around, and eventually will go through the hole at the bottom. And the typical question you wanna ask, for this is, I should say this is very important in many, many industrial applications. And the question you wanna ask is, how long do particles stay in the funnel? That, you know, what's the resonance time? That's the most important physical parameter. Happening here. Yeah, so we're going to consider. Actually, I've done a, quite a bit of work on the multi particle system, but let's consider the one particle system. Okay, what could be easier than this? Okay, the particle comes down, hits the wall a few times, eventually bounces out through the, um, through the hole. Okay, now 
Remember, so here there's a few parameters. One is that the, what we're going to focus on here is the angle, theta, the angle of the walls. Okay, so if theta is 90 degrees, it would be very steep. If theta was small, it would be very, very shallow. Okay, so let's look at this, what we see. Basically, what it says to you is the steeper the slope of the walls, the particle will stay in the system for a shorter time. Okay, so this is the average duration and this is the angle. Okay. What could, what else could, <laughs> seems completely obvious, what else could happen? What else could possibly happen? Here we took an example, E is 0.3. It's actually a pretty small coefficient of restitution. What happens if we take something a little more realistic, let's say 0.8? Okay, so surprisingly, it's no longer monotonic. It's actually very complicated. You have little bumps here and, uh, the overall trend is still downwards, but it's certainly not monotonic. Okay, so let's make E even bigger, you know, unrealistically big, 0.99, and now we can see, oh, this is something crazy. Okay, this is, we've got lots of big bumps here. This is completely non-monotonic. And we can also kind of artificially put E equals one, and then you see that you have these big, uh, well, these little little tongues, I guess, where you have very big uh, residence time in these little angles. You know, between 45 and 51 degrees, I get these big times. And between 59 and 64 or something, also get a big residence time. So why is this? Why is this happening? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to look at two different angles which have this completely different behavior. This is 45 and this is 46. So we're gonna look at the, what happens in these two cases. And what am I plotting here? I'm plotting, this is 45 is in the top uh, case. This is 46 degrees in the bottom case. And what I'm plotting is the duration divide, as a function of X. X is gonna be the input location. So obviously if I put X equals zero, the particle just falls straight through and you get this, you know, you'll get this, whatever, whatever that time is, a pretty short time. If it, it comes over here, the, if I input it, you know, X equals 40 or something, the particle will bounce around a little bit and then eventually go out. So it will take longer. But you can see it's completely different behavior. For 45, angle, for 45 degree angle, occasionally you get long um, residence times, but mostly it's, the residence time is pretty short. Whereas for 46, it's a very, very regular pattern. You get big blocks, big, big blocks of input locations where you get very long residence. And then, you know, just some small ones where you, where the particle goes through quickly. So why is this? Let's look at some examples on the, of, of typical trajectories. On the left, we've got 45. And what happens here is the particle comes in, bounces around, bounces around, bounces around a few times and eventually goes out. And here, also this is 45 degrees, bounces around, bounces around, eventually goes out. Now what happens if I have 46 degrees? Well, the difference here is that the particle comes down, bounces over here, bounces over here, bounces over here, and now goes back. And re almost repeats the same pattern. So this thing just goes back and repeats, and back and repeats. And this thing will robustly um, repeat the same pattern. It's not like the 45 degree, which is somehow getting scattered. The 46 angle is, uh, the 46 angle degree angle is actually much more coherent motion. And if I choose a different input location, I get a more complicated orbit, I, I get a, a different orbit, but it still has a kind of the same coherent pattern. And we can do the same thing between 59 and 61 degrees. Same thing, same thing. 59 degrees, you can see you get this random bouncing around, eventually hits the exit quickly. 61, we get a coherent pattern, bounce down here, comes over and then, oops, sorry, and then goes back. And uh, different angles, we get, a diff we get a different kind of behavior, but we get this coherent pattern. 
Now, what we can do, this is a pretty simple thing. We, we look at what is the simplest possible periodic orbit. And that's an orbit where the particle starts here, hits here, bounces here, comes back, and bounces up here, and just keeps repeating like that. And this is an easy problem. We can just find the location and velocities of all the uh, orbits, and we can solve it. You get the simple analytical solution. And uh, we just need to make sure, of course, that these locations don't uh, occur outside of the funnel. So there's these little constraints, but that's okay. And uh, we can actually see there are four variables. Actually, there are four variables, x, y, u, and v. But in fact, because I, I'm interested in locations of collisions, what uh, if I know that the particle is going to hit the wall, if I know the x location, I, I know the wall's a straight line, therefore I know the y location. And also because we're considering elastic particles, I know that there'll be conservation of energy. So in fact, I can also eliminate x. So really I only have uh, u and v. So what, I do, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a map. If I give you the, the location, and the, the velocities here, it will tell you the velocities here and here, and then when it comes back, it will go over to here. So we can make up a map which tells us the, the if I give you the input velocities, it will tell you what are the, um, uh, what, what are the, um, the resulting velocities after the, the, after the, the sequence of collisions in, in the orbit. And of course, this is just a, it's a map. And I know that there's a, there's a fixed point, which is, the, which is the orbit itself. And then I can linearize around that fixed point. And this now just becomes a, if I linearize, I've just got a, you know, a simple two by two matrix, which is just multiplying the, um, the uh, deviations from the, from the, um, uh, from the solution. And if I work out the eigenvalues of that matrix, what you get is the following. So this is the angle. Here's probably between 30 and 60. And of course, if the eigenvalues are bigger than one, or one of the eigenvalues has modulus bigger than one, then the, um, the, the system will be, that fixed point will be unstable. And as you can see between, as long as you're less than 45 degrees, you will get an unstable orbit. If you're bigger than about 51 degrees, you will also get an unstable orbit. But in between, you will have, you, in fact, if you look in the complex plane, this will be a pair of complex um, eigenvalues which are on the unit circle. So this will be neutrally stable. So that's what we have. And in, so to ensure stability of the orbit, we need lambda one and lambda two must be less than or equal to one. And the only way we can do that is by having the eigenvalues of this matrix equal to one. And it turns out you can solve that for the simplest orbit, you can solve that explicitly. You get a condition like this. It's just a condition on theta, uh, on cos theta, polynomial in cos theta. And we can actually invert it directly and we see that theta, this orbit, this orbit will be stable if theta is between 45 and this inverse cos of something, something, which works out to be almost exactly 51 degrees. So if I plot that, that's exactly the area where our numerical simulations show that you have this weird phenomena. And we can do that for different orbits, uh, you know, more, slightly more complicated orbits. And each one of these bumps corresponds to a, um, a stable periodic orbit. Okay, so what's the conclusion? Uh, maybe just have enough time. So a single inelastic particle falling through a hopper, you might think that's a very simple bit, uh, problem. Uh, in fact, I did when I, I first started studying the multiple particle system and, uh, and I kept getting behavior I couldn't understand and finally realized that oh, the problem, why it's complicated is because the single particle system is complicated. And then for small e, the resonance time just increases uniformly as you would expect. But when you have larger E, there are small windows of wall angles which have this you know, anomalously, anomalous, anomalously long resonance time. And we've developed an analytical theory that predicts this behavior and shows the mechanism. The mechanism is just the existence of stable periodic orbits. 
So let me uh, thank everyone for your attention uh, and finish here. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this very nice presentation. So are there any questions? Um, can I ask one, please? Maybe we can, sorry, we can unmute and clap our hands. I think that's nicer than this. <laughs> pictures. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Thank you very much. So please, Samuel, ask a question. Okay. Okay, so um, my question is about this uh, single falling particle. Um, it's a particle falling through the through, through by, by gravity. Gravity makes it fall. So um, have you have you ever considered how like acceleration might affect this uh, residence time? Which which kind of acceleration? Sorry. Uh, well, the the particle is falling through a gravity field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, how would like uh, like that gravity acceler that gravity acceleration affect the particle's fall? Or did you just keep the the acceleration constant throughout your measurements? Oh yeah, yeah. So this the gravity is just constant in this in this uh, in this theory. Okay. Yeah, we are not we are not doing something on a huge scale. We're just talking, you know, we're just doing these are systems which are just, you know, a few meters, uh, a few meters uh, yeah, in terms of the, their extent. So there's no there's no large gravity variations. Okay, thank you. Last question? Yeah, Any please. other questions? Okay, please. Yes, uh, I have a couple of questions. First question about the first part of the talk. So typically, I mean, this is a, it's a nice work. I learned about this uh, shared in effect. It's quite interesting. I'm thinking about in reality, right? In reality, when you talk about the coefficient of restitution, it's not constant. It depends on the impact velocity, it depends on the size, it depends on the properties of particles. Is it possible to extend your model, your theory part, so that it include some kind of a velocity dependent coefficient of restitution and compare it with uh, some simple experiments? I think this can be done pretty quickly. Right, so, so that's, that's the first question. That's a good question. So in fact, the, the coefficient, what you said is, is completely correct. The coefficient of restitution is, um, does have velocity dependence. Now this is a big controversial topic in granular materials because a lot of people argue that it's very important that when the velocity of the collision becomes very, very small, that you let the coefficient of restitution get closer and closer to one. Okay, many people argue that. In fact, it, if you do very, very careful measurements, you can observe this uh, effect. But in fact, it does take very, very careful measurements. So usually in engineering applications, people just tend to, tr you know, they look at the coefficient of restitution and it is almost constant over, you know, re re relatively large ranges of velocity. So this is just a kind of simple assumption. And the, th the, the, the computation is just much, much easier. You know, it, it just becomes a kind of, in some sense, the, the, the mechanics that we're doing is just simple high school mechanics. I don't need to solve any difficult nonlinear equations involving the velocity. And uh, so that's why most people in this field choose the coefficient of restitution to be constant. But what you said is totally true that, in, you know, there is some dependence on velocity. So. Yeah, in principle, we could do that, but it would just make the theory become more and more complicated. But yeah, I think it, it's an important, it can be an important um, factor. I'm not sure if that's yeah. really a good question. Yeah, I think it's good. Great. I just need to know whether it is doable or not. Because my, the, the motivation behind my question is that many particle particle interactions in reality in applications the particle-particle interactions are not simply just hard wall interactions, hard sphere interactions, right? So there may be other, let's say, magnetic force, electrostatic force, or some cohesive force associated with that. 
And all these interactions can be somehow coupled to the coefficient of restitution. If you tune how the coefficient of restitution as a function of your properties, then you can use the coefficient of restitution as a framework to, to estimate all different types of interactions. If you theory you can do that and compare with a systematic investigation of, and let's say experiments with different types of interactions between the particle and the walls and between the particle and the particles, that will be a great uh, kind of, from, from my perspective, a great impact for the, for the community because then you can provide a general framework for this kind of force prediction, right? This is uh, my motivation. That's very, that, yeah, that's a very interesting, it's a very interesting idea. And, and I think, you know, I, I need to say that there's many, many things I did not include, you know. One of the, one of the things that makes granular materials both interesting and very, very difficult is that there are many, many complicated forces. You mentioned cohesion forces. These can be very, very important. You know, the things just stick together. Okay, and then you also have uh, frictional forces, of course. This also can be, especially when you have very tightly packed material, frictional forces are very, very important. And yeah, so I think these, these, are, these, are, these, are, these are certainly important. They, I think some of them can fit into, into the idea you're talking about, the framework you're talking about, which is you try to put all of the forces into some kind of coefficient of restitution. But sometimes it may not be as easy as, as we might hope because these uh, interactions are basically instantaneous. And some other of the forces that you mentioned, like cohesion or other types of body forces, they are not instantaneous. So it may be a little harder, but I still think there's some, there's, there's a quite a good idea underlying what you are, what you are saying even though it may not be completely easy to do or completely straightforward to do. Yeah, actually. Is it just me or is Kai frozen? Yeah, he disappeared. Jonathan, you're still yeah, there, right? No, it's on my computer. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Kai was trying to ask something. Okay. So, so is other questions or Hi, are you back? Yes, I'm back. I can ah, ask questions okay, until the end of the day, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I was just uh, dropped out. It's already twice for today, and uh, yeah, for the co just back to the coefficient of restriction, we have some investigations on the wet cohesive. Let's say a particle is uh, just coated with liquid. This is a situation for many chemical engineering processes. And we kind of figured out that you can, for this case, you have an extreme, uh, let's say interesting and also strange situations that when the velocity is small, then they stick to each other, right? When it's large, then it starts to grow from zero until a certain value. So this can be captured by an analytical model that we, we published some years ago. It would be great if you can use this uh, kind of a dependency and check whether it's possible to extend that the model to the to the wet particle collisions yeah right? that would be wonderful so yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah. that's it we, we yeah, do yeah. have a we do have a formula for that for yeah, instantaneous that's... sometimes when it's just coated particles the collision can be instantaneous it may just stick but it does not rebound but still it can be if it is rebound we can treat it as an instantaneous uh, collision yeah, fantastic. Would you mind just the paper, please? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Pleasure. And uh, my next question is about the the shading effect. So uh, it's an excellent explanation, but I'm wondering when you discuss about the dilute. You say it's a dilute system. So how dilute is a dilute system? How do you define the dilute? So you say that typically when you talk about kinetic gas theory, so the particle collision, you also need to calculate probability, right? For the particles uh, to collide within a certain amount of time. And uh, in that case, you need to define a certain region. For example, a particle moving, that's uh, this sphere moving towards you, and then double the radius. This is the region that the other particle may collide. Of course, it depends on time, depends on the region, size of the region. And uh, uh, my feeling is that, the deep 
that we show because of the shading effect. Is it possible to, to have some simple argument to predict the angle? So the dip is close to 90 degrees, 80 is some, some degrees. Understand qualitatively why is it so? And uh, I'm thinking about whether the length scale of the particle or the length scale of the mean free parts of the particle, does that uh, play a role in the, in, in the system you are considering? Because I missed the first part of the, the first 20 minutes, so I, I don't know whether I so the, what I mean by so what I mean in this in fact what I really mean by dilute ultimately is that the probability that a particle experiences two or more collisions in this you know hitting of the wall and bouncing off that probability is low and I think you know from the graphs we can see pretty clearly that as long as that probability you know is below 10 or 20 percent actually the theory is working mm -hmm. very well so it's very different from classical um mm -hmm. classical dilute gas theory because in classical dilute gas theory you you have the concept of the mean free path you mm -hmm. need the mean free path to be much longer but this is different because all the particles are coming in you know before they hit the wall basically the mean free path is infinity I mean, if the wall mm -hmm. wasn't there, the particles would just all just stream past, they would just carry on and they would never collide with each other. So it's, somehow it's the wall which is creating collisions. And then after the, after the collision, after the particle collisions have occurred, the particles just go off. And again, eventually the, the mean free path will go back to being infinity. So, so mm -hmm. the, the, it's really, it's just that moment when the particles are, are nearby the wall this is when you need to control the, 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 you have to make sure that the number, the, the probability of a particle experiencing more two or more collisions is not too high. So that's ultimately what we found when the theory works and when the theory doesn't work. Initially, we weren't thinking in those terms. We were, we were thinking, you know, more in terms of dilute gas theory, but having mm -hmm. you know, computed the, um, the, the results that that's what we found so it's very different it's very different from from the you know typical dilute gas theory mm -hmm. again okay. I, i'm not really sure i answered your question yeah sure sure thanks yeah and the uh, the second part of your talk the, the funnel so what is the initial condition so you set this uh, ball a little bit away from the center and does it matter how far away this off center? Uh, so, so what I would do is I would just randomly choose the location. I, I, perhaps I forgot to say this. Uh -huh. yeah, I randomly choose. I randomly choose the location, and I'm just going to drop the I ball with zero from I the see. top with zero velocity, okay. and uh, and just let okay. it fall to the thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. So I think in the, in the okay. results I showed, I just took a uniform distribution along the top of the uh, funnel for where, where they were dropped. Okay. Okay, which means that depends on the D, depends on the, the, to the size of the, of the orifice. Yeah, then you cool. may have, because when you are just in exactly the center, you don't have any collision, right? Mm -hmm. So this will- you, you make the D very, very up. big. Yeah, if you make the D very, yeah. very big, then of course this, uh, you know, kind of nothing happens. The, yeah, yeah. the particles just fall through the middle. So the results, yeah. I've, the results I've basically shown are just for, it works better. This mechanism works better if D is smaller. Of course, you can't make it too small because then no particles will ever go through the, uh, will ever go through the funnel. I remember this uh, for, for this, uh, for this, uh, let's say, for the flow of many particles, there's a critical D at which that you yeah. will flow continuously, right? It's about three yeah. or four. Correct. Yeah. That's right. So uh, I'm just wondering, for single particle, do you see some change at that, at that uh, critical dimension? So I think what, what happens or, in- Or you the, don't, yeah. In, in the jamming of them? What happens is the that's arching. Yeah, the part, the particles can form chain structures, and those yeah. chain structures can then support an infinite weight above the uh, above the chain structures. <coughs> but here we we, we yeah. can't get that. So yeah, we mm -hmm. that, that just can't can never occur. So 
we um, yeah. we never the, there's no there's no strange behavior like associated with jamming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that makes sense. And for okay. all the discussions you make, you don't have any rotation or yeah. friction or force considered, right? Uh, that's right. There's no what I've okay. talked about here has no friction. But in fact, the the mm -hmm. first system friction will make very very little difference. The sec the second system actually, if you include friction, it um, the type of orbit you get actually are more more robust. It makes this system more. Um, makes this phenomenon more easy to spot or more, you know, more mm -hmm. important, but um, it's just more complicated and uh, the, the analysis is more difficult and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not, it doesn't come out like, you know, everything's simple and I can just work, work out some nice little polynomials and, and get the, um, I get the answer. But overall, the, the, the mechanism is kind of, this, kind of similar. That the main difference is that there's in, when you include friction, there's only one periodic orbit. It's an orbit which ba basically just bounces back, backwards and forwards uh, from one side to the other. And in fact, we did some experiments, <laughs> as you can imagine, very, very easy to do experiments in this. And if you take a very frictional wall, you can kind of, you can see that very clearly that the particles just basically just bounce backwards and forwards from one to the other. Whereas if you take Teflon and ping pong balls, you can get this complicated, uh, more complicated rebound uh, structures. So yeah, we, we can include friction, but it's just, it's just makes everything more and more and more complicated. Thanks, that's all, thank you. Okay, then let's thank Jonathan again for this uh, very nice presentation. Thank you, thank you. It's really a pleasure to, to meet you all. Very good. Yeah, we, uh, we hope to see you once in person in Kunshan, right? When <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. All this is over. So thank you very much also for all of you coming to, to the seminar and see you again uh, for the next talk next to Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.